I'm Samuel Ross, and this is the Dazed and Converse Open to Change Mentorship Program. It's going to be focused on this ideology that we kind of hold of creative entrepreneurship, which is really about creative directors and designers being at the forefront of business development for the next generation of the fashion industry, you could say. And today I'm here with the All Star team who have exceptional businesses which are really beginning to develop or on the cusp of you know, moving into their next phase. Uh, I'm really glad to be here with Alex from the Essence team, who, you know, Alex and I have worked together from the very beginning of a cold war going into wholesale. And Alex, you were saying it's like 11 seasons now. 11 seasons, yeah. So, you know, Alex is here to kind of highlight the real importance of um, understanding how to kind of scale um, you could say a fashion business or streetwear line or something which is maybe quite abstract in its early inception into a business that can then go on to accrue further retailers and moving to run ratios and go on to build, uh, you could say stable campaigns and, and really move forward. Hi, I'm Far Watkins. And I'm Fawn Watkins. And we are creative art directors based in London, specialising in graphic design and hmm. art direction. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My name's James Taylor. I'm the, the founder and director at Greater Goods. I say that, but I'm also the intern. I'm also the graphic designer. Um, wearing multiple hats. I'm Coco Mel, uh, a fashion-focused stylist, creative consultant and content creator, specialising in sneakers and streetwear, working out of London. I started my brand, St. London, in 2013. Um, the was just to change the, the narrative within my area um, and to, to get the, the kids to, you know, just get their minds off being on the roads, following, just wanting to be a footballer and going into fashion, something that no one really was doing in my era. I'm Tiziana, I'm from Italy, and I'm an environmental scientist. So I mainly deal with glacier retreat related to climate change. I'm Nathan Clement, I'm 19 and I come from Raining Island. Um, it's a tiny island off the coast of Madagascar. I came in Switzerland to study film at Geneva School of Art and Design. So my name is GB, I'm 21 years old. I live in Paris, I'm a photographer. Uh, I was graduated in 2020 in uh, the Courtrage School, a new school founded by the film director Lajli. I think art direction is such a broad uh, subject. You can kind of um, go into, you know, music videos, cinematography, film and everything. So I think we would like to um, become more of a niche, like go into a particular field, but so far now, I think we're kind of still, um, we like being able to do different subtext. Sub yeah. um, I mean, I, I'd like to go into gaming. I think yeah. that there's definitely yeah. um, an interest there, yeah. especially with kind of FX and CGI or anything like that. And then obviously um, a collaboration with a brand to do an actual product as well. I think that would be yeah. another thing that we can probably branch into. Yeah, I think everything that we do right now obviously exists in a virtual space. So a physical product, I think would be quite interesting. Yeah, whether it's to design a space um, in a store somewhere or um, design like merch for like a brand, I think that would be um, something we we'll definitely want to branch into. For sure. Out of the, the, the breadth of deep work within your practice, how do you kind of take, you know, one to two core elements and then expand that into an online and offline world, um, which is based on experience, um, merch, um, almost information which um, is, is, of course, enjoyable and, and exploratory in its uh, presentation but also really just nails down what your identity is and, 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 and having that core, you know, distinction or, or signature of works that can be applied online and offline as an experience could be really quite interesting to, to look about 
gaining more exposure across those, those generations. But if you can find a way to communicate a compressed identity um, in a very simplistic manner, which is enjoyable, um, it just opens up so many different demographics on both you know, the bleeding edge and on both the in institutional uh, front. I've spoken to a lot of people and that scaling is always the question that comes up. Um, for me, it's always been keeping it on that, that fence of, I, I treat it as like oil painting. An oil painter doesn't paint a thousand canvases of like the same thing. He does one and then keeps it as that. So I try to balance in that realm of fashion and design, but also keep it as a creative endeavor. Um, but scaling for me is a tricky one is probably the main thing I'm always battling with. Um, I feel like as soon as I scale on big numbers, it becomes more of a business that I will be filling that director role a bit more rather than the, the graphic designer or the, the maker. Um, for me, I, I don't have a, a long-term plan of where that direction is going to go in. I have wholesaled uh, occasionally. I found it didn't really work on the method I was doing. It was just me creating a lot of products and then selling them for a wholesale compared to direct to consumer on my web store. I think for me, I think I'm very much like nowadays anyway, I'm just kind of like organically letting it foster into, I think into whatever it needs to become for whoever it needs to like, need to be there for. So I definitely think I want it to fundamentally be like a resource. Um, you know, a resource for young black women com coming up through the creative ranks to actually like tap into. So like, you know, like I always make sure that I'm always open and available and accessible to anyone, you know, who's had hardship within the industry, who maybe isn't too sure on how to navigate that, um, you know, doesn't really know what to do and where they want to go. And I want to help steer that young, you know, that young black woman in how to do so in an authentic way that isn't led by trend and, you know, clout chasing and anything like that. It's done through like authentic means and values. And I think through that, I kind of, I think I just kind of want it to just to resonate with multiple people across like I suppose like globally like you know worldwide I don't want it just to be capped just to London even though that obviously is like my hub but beyond that you know I'm Jamaican and Dominican descent so you know I would love to kind of like open it up to the Caribbean islands you know whether it's through mentorship apprenticeship scheme whatever it is to kind of help I think like resources over there in that in those spaces actually let them know it's possible to be where I am Building out that, that consultancy model and how it works for talents un under your roster. The um, potential community negotiations with, with commercial partners is just something, even again, even if you're kind of like subcontracting that out, that's something to look at as well, you know. Um, and how do you almost compress down all of the activities of your business and of your limited company into uh, a really short ledger? which almost sits, you know, if you could put it onto two pieces of paper, you'd have your company values and principles, then you've had, you'd have your services. Ideally, you've got one, well, ideally you have three services, so you've always got cash flow running and you can kind of oscillate accordingly. And then you've got your ledger, which is almost like, when you do work with us, this is what you can expect and this is what we expect from you within this, partners, within this partnership. So you're literally taking all, all of what you're doing and literally just um, recollating it into three different formats, you know? So um, I'm looking to have a diffusion brand, um, which is going to be based off the back of the Yaboa bit. And I'm still going to keep the Saint element, which is going to be Saint Yaboa. Um, so a lot of people were saying to me, don't get rid of the Saint part. Mm. And um, at the time, I was, I was very angry at the, at the time because it's like, I've, this is my baby. I've been running with it for eight years. I've got a cease and desist now. I've got to stop everything and start from scratch, which I didn't want to do. Um, but I do want to, you know, just pay homage to it still and just show that it hasn't broken me. I'm still going to move forward with it and um, just have something for, you know, friends and family to, to buy into. Um, and um, the Yaboa bit is pure luxury for me. I will have a few pieces that will be available and whatnot. But the reason why I, I want to go into that is because um, I just feel like I want to be able to, to tell the story more through the products. Um, I like me in, in in particular. I can't design a piece of clothing without a story attached to that one thing. Um, so it kind of is for me to say I've got nine collections done. It's pretty amazing because everything is based off a life story. I think that's super smart, man. Like 
A couple of years ago, everyone was just fighting for like the middle fat of the market. And now, you know, that's been cut out. Jerry's a, a real good example of just cutting that out and just going for the bottom end, which is democratic, accessible, easy to scale, almost non-seasonal product, which sounds like what St. Yeboah could potentially be, which can offer you the high margin, which is again, like that's, that's, that's the bread and butter of the fashion industry, having that high margin jersey or wearable pieces that actually are quite democratic because everyone can access them. And then having that top line storytelling on, on Yeboah, um, on, on like the, you can almost say, again, like the very much luxury foray. In terms of how you were operating prior, were you, were you more so pointing towards wholesalers before, or was it more so, D to C? Um, so I've, I've, well, in the, it, I've done two collaborations, one with um, H. Lorenzo and one with Selfridges, which I, I sold out in um, 2018. I, I did Selfridges, like my first ever pop-up ever, like nowhere mm -hmm. else. And um, in 2019, I opened up my first pop-up in my area. So um, the uh, RBKC um, gave me um, a store in my area for like a five-month period um, where I had an opening party. Um, I, I wanted to put it in a place where people wouldn't have expected me to put it in instead of me going to like a Carnaby Street. I put it right in the, the nitty-gritty parts of my area, which is Goulburn, Labrador Grove. Mm -hmm. um, it's just like notorious for like violence and crime and there was no break-ins we had an after party there was no problems mm. and i just want to show people that we could have things like that in these sort of areas without any commotion i'd say the uh, the main thing was uh, probably working uh, with people and bringing their uh, identity and their like uh, traits into the uh, greater piece that you're trying to make. And so really working together with getting insights from everyone involved, whether that's like uh, cast, uh, crew also, and just really get everyone's uh, sensibility and creative um, mind working together. So many of us in the industry have kind of complained about what's happened this past year and that, you know, we haven't been connecting physically and it's changed the way we work. But within that space, it's allowed things like film to take such a center stage in terms of the way that brands storytell. Um, and, you know, companies that previously would have, you know, spent that budget on a fashion show are investing in, you know, beautiful photography for their lookbooks or storytelling for a film. And I think what's so special about that is there's sort of a democratization to it too because um, it gives access to everyone to that kind of storytelling to what that vision is whereas you know before maybe sure you could see a collection photo on Vogue Runway or something like that but not everyone was able to experience that the sensibility of what the designer was trying to storytell um, so I think that there's tremendous opportunity within this space right now particularly to sort of meld those two worlds together and be able to you know partner like you're saying sam um with a brand and the more artistic component and you know i think someone that kind of does it at the top of their game is someone like gucci um and you see it you know the way they, they story tell through their film through their photography and even beyond in terms of the you know physical installations and things like that that they do Com completely and i mean when you were sharing those thoughts, Alex, and after you know what Nathan was sharing about his practice, I guess the fundamental reality is that, that we don't need any more clothes. What we actually need are new narratives given visibility <laughs> and new narratives to kind of make, make people dream and feel seen and visible and elated and excited and to feel something. So the artist of, I mean, the artist, the, the, the purpose of the visual communicator and, and the, the designer is really far closer to an artist than it's ever been before. You know, I, I think that there's so many ways you, you can look at it, whether it's through like reconstituting goods like, like James is, is, is producing, whether it's about a more introspective tale told um, to local communities, such as what, what Reese is doing. I think that spending as much time on really what Fun and Far do and specialise in as visual artists and art directors is literally the key to having a distinguished space within the market that is irrefutable. You know, you just need to spend as much time wilding and challenging and contesting 
your ideas and trying and failing different visual means and languages again and again and again and looking at what sticks and what doesn't stick and we call it A-B a testing, like market testing, where we'll put something out and if it doesn't get the response we want, maybe it was too soon or maybe there was something wrong with, with, with how we communicated or maybe, you know, maybe we need to find new ways to reconfigure that idea. But this idea of being like performance artists is key to being a designer or visual communicator now. As I told you at the beginning, I'm a photographer and I started this in 2017. Uh, when I went to my country, to Mali, in West Africa. And since 2017, I've been working for brands and for uh, some galleries. I already like show some photos in, like at the Palais de Tokyo in Paris or some group exhibition by a London curator named Ben Broom. I don't know if you know it, if you know him. And with my experience, even if I'm a young artist, I really want to give the opportunity, the opportunity to younger people like me to to um, to explore some other universe because for people like us it's not easy to to do photography to do film today even if in 2021 i still feel like that there is still the need to work hard to to see more people like us to be to be in these um, in these industries so as i told you in my studio we have the other thing called cultural program and that's why I really want to to give um, all my knowledge to people. And even by working with younger people, I feel like that at my age, it will help me to grow up more. And because I will be, um, I will be, I will work with like many different people. And all of this helped me to to build myself like um, a little more step by step, you know. How do you then, to be honest, combat the system is the question. And what's the best way of combating through integration as well as combating outside of it? Because you want to be inside the room whilst also building your own own room. And that's, this isn't just to you, but this is kind of to everyone. And I'm just kind of rifting and, and sharing thoughts. And again, to speak just super honestly and openly about the, the growth trajectory of Cold War and a couple other contemporary brands and artists of, of my generation, um, there's always there's always this pendulum swing of how do you knock down the wall, but also make sure you can enter that room if, if you wish to. And it's just something to build into all of, all of your strategies is to make sure that you're in, you can build outside of the room, but also making sure you can be in the room if, if you wish to. Because often what, what you'll find is that as your career starts to move forward and forward, the industries operate on a very aut autocratic system and again i'm speaking super honestly here which is the point of this you know this session and it's it's good to be able to communicate with them and show them the understanding and responsibility that your communities have given to you because at the end of the day at the end of the day 10 20 30 40 years from now when your careers have kind of gone to the highest heights, you're gonna be in these rooms and these rooms need to look different. So how do you go about opening soft rapports with some of these institutes so that you can literally change the face of them in 20 to 30 years? It's, it's looking at this as a long game as well as an immediate game for continued growth. You know, that's how we've got a Steve McQueen, that's how we got a John O'Confra. You know, you have to know how to not work with these people, but be, be seen and be visible whilst also corralling and bringing forward your, your own demographics and people. Yeah, yeah, 100%, that's true. And I think like we already do it today, like with you, you have a big name, you do a lot of things and you give opportunities to young people like us to, to get like to know more about the system. And I think it's like this to work with all this cooperation to build something like solid between them and us. I don't think we have to be like in our side and let mm. them be because if we do that, nothing will change. I think we all have to be like working together and to to really like create something solid between all communities and all these big corporations. As you all move forward in, in your career, as you start to open these doors, as you start to be more recognized as, as your career goes, the spaces are only going to get whiter and whiter and whiter and whiter. And you've really got to look at that from like a percentage perspective. Like I'm going to use the, the main um, 
numbers I know that are true. You know, in the UK, only three percent of the population is under the moniker of black. You know, that means out, out of you know, in terms of like black African heritage, you're looking at 0.8 percent of the population. You know, the same for Caribbean. It's just a sliver. It's a sliver. So now it's looking at as business people who identify as being a, a minority. Once your own um, your own mission and story has been told, how do you then scale your visibility and representation for others to see, but also make it relatable outside of your own community? Something we we speak about this a lot um, in, in a cold war, and I think it's looking at how do you how do you segment um, the operations of your your business and I'd say to put the studio underneath the business and it might be that the majority of um, you could say artworks like pure artworks that are almost creative expressions actually all fall under you know your marketing activity which are actually a cost on a yearly basis for your brand and then you should have a separate column of you know collaborators that you're comfortable working with and outside of that separate column you almost need to have um, I, to be honest, almost like a, a bread and butter column, which is really looking at what are the, the core functions that we're willing to operate in commercially to keep the studio going. The more commercial you do, the more artworks that are produced, and that keeps your ratio um, to your audience and to potential uh, partners very clear that you're an artistic studio who functions in corporate and commercial environments. I think also something that um comes to mind is I was reading this interview with um, Adrian, the president of Comme des Garçons, and I, you know, within this landscape, they are truly artists, right? It's, you know, the shows are incredible and her design aesthetic is incredible. And what he was speaking to was kind of, you know, they've been this, um, they've been super directional since they opened, but have always operated within the framework of the fashion calendar. So, you know, they can be as artistic as forward thinking as they want to be, but they're going to present their collections when buyers are there. So it's being able to balance, you know, this is our vision. We're not going to compromise on how we present it, but we are going to present in a time when we know that we can see retailers so we can make money. So kind of playing with that dynamic too. Yeah, but then how do you make something like that if it's only presented to buyers? Therefore, it's a consumerist kind of um, backdrop. How do you turn something like that and not make it seem performative? Because I feel like obviously we all care about a lot of social issues and a lot of um, like different ethos and everything. But I feel like as soon as you project it into a market that's something that's sellable, it then becomes almost like a performance art which almost seems really insincere. Um, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, but I also, I don't necessarily agree. I don't necessarily agree that because there is a commercial aspect of it, does it devalue the art? Um, I think that artists should be paid, you know? I think exactly what Sam was saying, like this idea of the struggling artist does not need to be what, what drives um, our evaluation of the artist. I think I just have like a guilty conscience and I'm always scared about every step that I take because I'm yeah. scared that I'm going to be like judged all the time. Yeah, I think that that stigma is changing though, you know, I think um, as young creatives are coming up and, you know, more people are coming into this space through non-traditional trajectories and things like that, um, we are more supportive of people getting paid. This goes back down to the notion of the struggling artist and the history of art education, right? Because it was always the working class kids went into art school and the upper middle class kids went to finance school. And I think that, you know, my journey has exactly. been really similar on understanding value, even in like a commercial field now. The, the only thing I can kind of say on that, which can give like an immediate effect or some type of resolution is Google and the internet are your best friends in terms of deep diving, you know, using channels like Reddit to find out what art directors and CMOs are actually getting paid. You know, these, these are like places which are almost still safe havens on the internet, which is getting more and more rare, where you can actually get a bit more of an agnostic insight, which isn't necessarily shielded or, or skew if. So really for myself, I learned about salary pay brands on the internet. 
even in terms of how much should I be paying my staff? When you're doing X amount of revenue, how much should you look to pay yourself? What's the market average? All of this is just deep diving online because you're right, we're not taught it in art school at all and we should be, but that's probably not gonna change very soon. So it's more so looking at how do we just utilize the exposure the internet can offer us to find out what should be charged and how much we should really be getting paid and how much you should all be paying yourselves and, and understanding that inherent value. But your way about going about it and your, your, your diagnosis of that is, is very truthful and I can't really add much to it apart from just keep searching and, and looking on, online. Um, speaking to peers who are close around you who may be relevant, even speaking to old course tutors on like LinkedIn and saying, look, how much should we actually be getting paid for X role? And these, it's still a taboo in British society to kind of bring these topics around money up. And actually the more you start to bring it up, you actually find people will share the information with you. It's just pushing past that taboo of the perspective of an artist or, or designer not making a living just needs to be eradicated and, you know, you guys just speaking this, hopefully to the right people can go about you getting that, that information. But if, if you don't get it from people, and if people are aloof, you just have to go online and, and deep dive where possible. The, the one that I'd, I'd close on, and that seems to be a through line, is just look at what your annual calendar looks like in terms of you know, commercial activity, in terms of how do you, um, or where do you make your money from your product, and then, uh, in terms of marketing and, and community. If you operate a 12 month calendar and have those four elements outlined, it's much easier to kind of look at where you want to be and how you, how you get to that, that goal in the next two to three years. Look at artists and generations above who have done what you kind of want to be part of and contribute to because often their snail trail is the blueprint. For myself, I ended up just looking at others who had been ahead and that became a model to kind of at least get things going or understanding if, if there is a, a uh, you know a partial road to go down and you'll quickly see that once you start mapping out all, all of these elements that there's nothing wrong with kind of pursuing a slightly more commercial route if anything it's going to give you the long-term security to continue being an artist who doesn't struggle across the long term and those are the uh, closing notes from my side so again thank you everyone it's, it's appreciated and thank you for your time Thank you very much. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Speak soon. Bye. 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 Bye.